Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope by now you had the time to take a look at the first course video and the course syllabus. If there is anything that's unclear to you, please post your questions in Teams. If you have more personal messages, please email me. I'd be more than happy to help you. Okay, so now let's get started with the second lecture of this week. After the introduction, now we will dive right in and get to the first topic, complexity. In this lecture, we will review some of the stuff we learned before in CISC 121, namely algorithm complexity. We have seen a variety of algorithms designed to solve different tasks, for example, sorting, search, optimization, classification, prediction, and clustering. You may also have noticed that problems have different requirements on their algorithmic solutions. For instance, some problems need only the best optimal solution. Some problems can take a solution that is good enough, but not necessarily the optimal one. All these different requirements influence the process of designing an algorithm to solve a problem. So whenever you are asked to design an algorithm, make sure the problem requirements are clearly understood. We also know that even given the same problem, we could have different algorithms that can solve it. So how to choose? Any algorithm has certain characteristics, just like the automobile. There are certain features that are part of the definition of a car. Wheels and the engine, for instance. These are the basics. However, when we buy a car, we certainly take into account other things, such as fuel efficiency, number of seatings, trunk capacity, and style. Similarly, attributes of algorithms may include correctness, ease of understanding, elegance, and efficiency. The most essential attribute of an algorithm is correctness. How do we know an algorithm is correct? It should hold and produce the correct output for every possible input instance. Once we know an algorithm is correct, we can go on and compare their other attributes, such as how intuitive they are, how elegant they are, and the last, their efficiency in terms of both space and the time. In this course, we mainly focus on time efficiency of an algorithm. Why should we care about time efficiency of an algorithm at all? You may wonder, especially now the hardware has been so advancing and we have incredibly fast computers. How much does it matter if an algorithm is inefficient? In this example here, we have a state-of-the-art rabbit computer and a vintage turtle computer. Rabbit is 1,000 times faster than turtle in raw computing power. Two programmers are asked to sort 10 million numbers. One programmer chooses to use insertion sort on rabbit, and another programmer chooses to use merge sort on turtle. We all know that the time efficiency of these two algorithms. Rabbit takes more than 5.5 hours using insertion sort, and the turtle takes only less than 20 minutes using merge sort. Now we see using a more efficient algorithm, even with a very poor, out-of-date computer, it runs 17 times faster than the state-of-the-art computer. Algorithm efficiency is as important as a hardware advancement. With the ever-increasing capacities of computers, we use them to solve larger problems than ever before. It is at larger problem sizes that the differences in efficiency between algorithms become particularly prominent. Having a solid base of algorithmic knowledge and a technique is one characteristic that separates the truly skilled programmers from the novices. With modern computing technology, you can accomplish some tasks without knowing much about algorithms, but with a good background in algorithms, you can do much more. Now let's use insertion sort to review how we determine the time complexity of an algorithm. Please recall how insertion sort works. 
we have a list of unsorted numbers and the need to put them in ascending order. The idea is to sort the numbers from left to right. The left side has the sorted numbers and we take one number at a time from the unsorted right side, find its place in the sorted portion and insert it. Following this example, initially the sorted left side has only one number, 5. We take the first number in the unsorted side, number 2, and find its place in the sorted left side for an insertion. We compare 2 with the number to its left, that's 5, and swap them since they are not in order. Once we have found the place to insert 2, we have two numbers in the left sorted portion. We then look at the first number in the unsorted right side, 4. We repeat the process of finding the right position to insert 4. We compare 4 with the numbers on its left, make swaps until the number left to it is smaller than 4. Then in the third iteration, we look at the first number in the unsorted right portion, number 6. We repeat the process and find the place to insert 6, and so on. Make sure you understand this and make another example and trace it by hand if necessary. Here is the program for insertion sort from the textbook. Now let's analyze its time cost. Each line of instruction takes some cost C for computer to execute, except for a line of comment. We also know insertion sort is a quadratic algorithm, meaning nested loops. So instructions inside a loop body will be executed repeatedly. So we also count how many times each line of instruction gets executed. Say the input has n numbers. It is quite straightforward for us to figure out the times for instruction 1 through 4. Note that the for condition is checked n times, but its loop body is repeated n minus 1 times. This is because in the last time j gets greater than n, then the for condition will be checked but we do not go into the loop body. Now let's look at instruction 5 through 7. This is a while loop nested inside the for loop. We notice that the number of times depends on the input list. If the key, say, is already in the right place, we only need to check the while condition once. On the other hand, if the key is smaller than all the numbers in the sorted left portion, we need to make j minus 1 swaps. Let's say the while condition is checked for tj times. In the jth iteration of the outer for loop, so in total, line 5 will be executed this many times, and the two instructions inside it will be executed this many times. Now for the overall complexity of this algorithm, Tn, we multiply the cost by the number of times for each line of instruction and sum them up. In the best case, when the input list is already sorted, the inner while loop is always skipped we check the while condition for once and then never get into the loop body. So tj will be 1. Then we can write tn accordingly. So in the best case, the complexity of insertion sort is a linear function of the input size n. What about the worst case, when the input list is in the reversed order? So now tj equals j meaning that for each key number, we perform j minus 1 swaps in order to move it to the front of the sorted left portion of the list. So we use this to replace all the tj's in the formula, and we get a quadratic function of m. That is, in the worst case, insertion sort takes quadratic time. Now we know the amount of time taken running insurgent sort depends on the input list, that is, 
how sorted it already is. In the best case, the algorithm runs really fast in a linear time. However, in the worst case, it runs in a quadratic time. While we have an input partially sorted, it will take some time in between the best and worst cases. So when we refer to the time complexity of the insurgent sort, which case should we use, best or worst? We use the worst case, since it gives an upper bound on the running time and it occurs fairly often in real practice. Now let's take a look at these four different time complexities, T1 through T4. We can make a table to see with the different input size n how much actual costs they have. We notice that the complexities with a higher order of n grow much faster. For instance, T3 and T4 grow much faster than T1 and T2. So the constant and the lower order items in each complexity do not matter that much. They are, in a sense, absorbed by the term with the highest exponent. Let's get rid of everything else except for the term with the highest exponents. Furthermore, we notice that the coefficient of the highest order term does not matter much either. When n grows large, arbitrarily large, so when we compare these four complexities, we can get rid of the coefficients too. Now we consider only the leading term without any coefficients, since the coefficients and the lower order terms are relatively insignificant for large values of n. To summarize, this is the rate of growth or order of growth of the running time that really interests us. We use the notation theta to put complexities of the same leading order in one category. All complexities that has the leading term of order n is in theta of n. So t1 and t2 are in theta n, while t3 and t4 are in theta n squared. You may wonder why we're not using the big O notation like we did before. We will see more on that next week. Here we use two graphs to show the comparison on the order of growth. n squared grows much faster than n, even when n squared takes a really small coefficient, but n takes a much larger coefficient. Initially, say here, 0.25 n squared is less than 10 times n, but after the cross point, When n becomes greater than 40, 10n never has the chance to catch up, and their difference becomes increasingly large. We use the insurgent sort as an example and took a very detailed look at the cost of executing every single line of instruction. Now that we know a lot of the details can be ignored and we only need to focus on the component of an algorithm that grows the fastest with the input size. Specifically here, I listed what we should consider all the three types of statements, sequential, iterative, and conditional statements. You may pause the video and take a read. To put it in, a more intuitive and straightforward way, here are some steps we can take when determining the complexity of an algorithm. Please read through them. Now let's look at the insurgent sort again and use what we just learned to determine its complexity. Here we have two loops. These are the components that will take the most running time. So for the for loop, we know it iterates through the entire list. So it, ha it has a order of n. And inside the for loop, there are some sequential instructions. They only take constant time, so we can ignore them. We have another loop, a while loop nested inside the for loop. It's taking an order of n as well. Okay, because these two loops are nested, so the overall complexity would be n times n. So 
we have the complexity of insurgent sort being n squared. So that'll be all for this week. The workload is pretty light for the first week by design. You hope that you find back your rhythm and take a good look at all the courses you have for this semester. Mark all the due dates and make a weekly plan. In the future, we typically will have three videos for each week. I also intend to make videos short, 15 minutes or so. So hopefully you don't end up watching hours and hours of videos for all the courses you have every week. Don't worry, we still cover all the materials as we would do in person. Videos are not 50 minutes long, it's because they are more concise. Um, they do not have any repetitive content, they don't pause, and they do not cost the time when you pause and read the slides or when I write on a blackboard. I also speak faster while recording videos because I take extensive notes and um, plan ahead exactly what I am going to say. Okay, so hope you find what we will be learning in this course interesting and exciting. I will see you in the next lecture.